For more than 40 years after 1945, the world was dominated by confrontation between two major power blocks, led by the United States and the Soviet Union. One of the most menacing and potent symbols of this was the nuclear bomber. During the first phase of the Cold War, this was the dominant weapon. Both sides maintained large fleets of nuclear bombers at a high level of readiness. They also continually probed each other's air defenses to discover weak points in them. During the late 1950s, the nuclear bomber was joined by the intercontinental ballistic missile, initially land-based. Then came the ballistic nuclear submarine. Thus the nuclear triad was born. It was to cast a long shadow, which was to remain right up until the very end of the Cold War. But alongside the nuclear threat was that of a blitzkrieg offensive by the Soviet Union and its allies into Western Europe, which NATO was primarily founded to protect. Here too, air power was intended to play a major role on both sides. It needed to gain supremacy in the skies above the battlefield. Air power could also make a significant contribution to victory on the ground by giving direct support to the armies. Such was the importance of air power during the Cold War that it was a major aspect of the arms race. Furthermore, the strategies developed by both sides much influenced aircraft design and tactics. Yet when the Second World War in Europe came to an end in May 1945, there was optimism, at least in the West, that the victors would coexist in harmony. Consequently, the Western Allies, especially the Americans, rapidly dismantled their vast wartime military armories. Literally thousands of wartime aircraft were scrapped or left to molder in aviation dumps in the desert. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, did little to reduce its massive military strength. However, in Washington, D.C., the continuing Russian military might was not seen as a significant threat. The reason was 
that the United States was the sole possessor of the most devastating of all the weapons of the Second World War, the atomic bomb. It was primarily for this reason that the US Strategic Air Command, known as SAC, was formed in March 1946 to provide a nuclear deterrent. Initially, SAC was equipped with just 270 aircraft, of which over half were B-29 bombers, the type used to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. SAC's charter laid down that it was to be prepared to conduct long-range offensive operations in any part of the world, either independently or in cooperation with land and naval forces, to conduct maximum range reconnaissance over land or sea, either independently or in cooperation with land and naval forces, to provide combat units capable of intense and sustained combat, employing the latest and most advanced weapons. That SAC might operate independently of land and naval forces largely enabled the U.S. Air Force to finally achieve its independence in July 1947, when President Harry S. Truman signed the National Security Act. But the USAF's first crisis, and indeed the first of the Cold War, which came just under a year later, had little to do with bombers. Relations between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union had been gradually worsening since 1945. And nowhere was this more apparent than in the former German capital, Berlin. The city lay deep in the Soviet zone of occupation, but was itself split into four zones, American, British, French and Soviet. But Stalin resented the presence of the Western Allies in the city and wanted them out. On the 24th of June, 1948, the Russians suddenly closed all access by road, rail and canal from West Germany to Berlin. The people of West Berlin were wholly dependent on these links for everything from food to coal. Slow starvation stared them in the face. The Western Allies, with their depleted armed forces, were in no position to go to war over Berlin. But what they could try to do was to keep Berlin supplied by air. And within two days of the imposition of the blockade, Operation Vittles was set in motion. The airlift was masterminded by General Curtis LeMay, Commander-in-Chief of the US Air Force in Europe. made his mark during 1939-45, first with the US 8th Air Force operating from Britain and then in the Pacific. It was LeMay who devised the low-level incendiary raids which so devastated Japan in the spring of 1945. Now he was faced with a challenge as stern as any. There were three officially agreed air corridors from West Germany to Berlin. Hamburg, Wunstorf, and Wiesbaden. All American, British, and French relief flights had to use these. Yet such was the efficiency with which the airlift was conducted that eventually no less than 13,000 flights per day were being made into Berlin. aircraft flew in everything that the people of Berlin needed in order to survive. It was indeed salvation from the skies.
Berliners themselves helped to unload the aircraft. The transports often took off again within an hour of landing in Berlin. The Russians didn't believe that the airlift could be maintained and contented themselves with occasionally buzzing Allied aircraft as they flew up the corridors to the city. Lieutenant Gail S. Halverson, the C-54 Skymaster pilot from Garland, Utah, typified the spirit of the airlift crews. He noticed the crowd of kids who daily gathered on the perimeter of Berlin's Tempelhof Airport to watch the aircraft flying in and out. Halverson began to drop them small bags of candy, suspended from parachutes made out of handkerchiefs. He would waggle his wings as he approached. Soon he became known to the children of Berlin as Der Schokoladeflieger, the chocolate flyer. Forty years later, there was a ceremony and display at Berlin Tempelhof in remembrance of the airlift. The chocolate flyer came back to the city for it. He recalled, I guess if there's one feeling that I have that, that uh, is special to me is the feeling we had in those days of flying night and day with a former enemy, someone we were trying to destroy, and they destroy us. We're working together as friends for their freedom. The real heroes, I think, are the Berlin Allies, are the Berliners themselves. Eventually, in May 1949, the Russians realized that the airlift could be maintained indefinitely and reopened the land and water links to Berlin. The first Cold War crisis was over. But even before the Berlin blockade began, the West had begun to rearm, and this led to the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO in April 1949. NATO was made up of many West European countries. The other members were the United States, Canada, and Iceland. Later, Greece, Turkey, West Germany, and Spain would join. Moscow, too, formed the Warsaw Pact of East European states. However, in August 1949, the Russians exploded their first nuclear device. The American monopoly on nuclear weapons had been broken, and the arms race had begun. Three years later, in November 1952, the Americans carried out their first successful test on the Iniwetok Atoll, deep in the Pacific, of a hydrogen bomb. Its destructive power was many times that of the atomic bomb. Less than a year later, the Russians had achieved the same. The US Strategic Air Command now assumed even greater importance in the defense of the free world. But was it up to the job? General Curtis LeMay, the orchestrator of the Berlin airlift, was now appointed to command SAC. He arrived at Strategic Air Command in 1949 with the reputation of being a hard taskmaster. This was as well, since budgetary restrictions during the immediate post-war years had resulted in SAC's operational efficiency being low. LeMay quickly stamped his personality on his men. Other targets in the shortest possible time. To us, the only difference between peace and war is where we place our bombs. LeMay instituted a rigorous training schedule, with the bomber crews carrying out numerous practice attacks on American cities. But SAC needed bombers that could fly on their own to the target, fast and high enough to ward off jet fighters. <laughs> 
piston-engined B-29s and their successors, the Convair B-36 with its engines mounted on the rear of the wings and Boeing B-50 were too slow. As a stopgap, jet engines were added to the B-36. In 1950, however, the Boeing B-47 Stratojet came into service. This had a top speed of over 600 miles per hour. SAC now had an effective strategic nuclear bomber. The British followed suit with their three V-bomber types, which included the Handley Page Victor. Most revolutionary of the trio was the Avro Vulcan with its delta wing configuration. The aim of this was to reduce drag and hence improve aircraft performance. It was, however, American aircraft designer Jack Northrop who largely influenced the delta wing concept. Northrop's long interest in so-called flying wings resulted in the 1946 B-35 piston-engined reconnaissance bomber. The aircraft was then converted to jet power as the YB-49, a plane of remarkable grace. But in early May 1950, the US Air Force, already committed to the Boeing B-47, canceled the project for budgetary reasons. The Russians, too, were also developing nuclear bombers. Their first post-war strategic type was a Tupolev Tu-4, almost an exact copy of the American B-29. In the mid-1950s, two Soviet jet bombers appeared. The first was the turboprop Tupolev Tu-95, NATO codename Bear. The other was the turbojet Myasischev M4 Bison. However, the Soviet nuclear bombers were not truly strategic. While Western Europe was well within their range, they could not fly to the continental United States and back. This was because they lacked an air refueling capability. In contrast, the US Air Force was now using air refueling as a matter of course to enable the bombers to reach their targets. Indeed, in March 1949, this technique enabled a Boeing B-50 called Lucky Lady 2 to be the first aircraft to fly non-stop around the world, a trip of nearly 25,000 miles. The Russian disadvantage increased when a new and even more powerful bomber, the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, began to join Strategic Air Command's growing armory in 1955. The B-52 was to remain in operational service for over 40 years. But on the 4th of October, 1957, the Russians astounded the world by launching a satellite into orbit around the Earth. Most people, this marked the dawning of the space age. But for military strategists, there was a more sobering realization. The Russians could only have achieved their space first through the use of a powerful rocket. Such a missile was capable of reaching North America and armed with a nuclear warhead could wreak untold destruction. The Americans also realized that given the enormous advances in radar during the previous decade, ground-launched missiles could also shoot down aircraft. 
decision was therefore made to follow the Russians and base America's nuclear deterrent on intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and the first Atlas rockets were deployed in 1958. A year later, Thor intermediate range nuclear missiles were deployed to Britain, where they were operated by the Americans in conjunction with the Royal Air Force. But Curtis LeMay and his successor in command of SAC, General Thomas Power, were convinced that the manned bomber could still operate in this new environment. Initially, one third of SAC's nuclear bombers was placed on 15 minutes readiness so that they could get airborne before missiles struck their bases. SAC also developed a new technique known as LABS, low altitude bombing system. A bomber would fly at low altitude to the target to minimize detection by radar. As he approached, the pilot would zoom upwards, releasing the bomb, which would fly up with him before falling back to earth and detonating. The pilot would then dive and make for home. Another option was the use of standoff nuclear missiles. B-52s were therefore fitted with Hound Dog, which had a range of 675 miles and flew at Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. LeMay and Power also instituted the development of a new bomber, the B-70 Valkyrie, and a prototype was built and tested. The concept behind this aircraft was the belief that if it flew high and fast enough, it could still evade the Soviet air defenses. The Valkyrie was capable of reaching Mach 3, but the sheer expense involved meant that it never entered production. SAC did, however, receive a supersonic bomber in 1961 the B-58 Hustler. The B-58 could fly at Mach 2, but lacked the range and payload of the B-52. In 1959, the strategic nuclear options were increased further when George Washington, the first submarine to carry the Polaris ICBM, was launched. This gave America a nuclear triad, consisting of submarine-launched ballistic missiles, land-based ballistic missiles, and manned nuclear bombers. The Soviets could not target all three at once, and hence the United States now had a second strike capability. Sachs ICBM armory grew from 180 to nearly 900 during the 1960s, while its aircraft strength was cut by half from its peak of 3,000 at the beginning of the decade. The coming of the missile age served to fuel the nuclear arms race still further make the prospect of nuclear war ever more awesome. But the Cold War was not just about nuclear deterrence, although this tended to overshadow all else. The military aviation of both sides had many other roles as well. One of the first specialist roles of Cold War aviation was inspired by the need to combat the threat of the nuclear bomber. During the early days when the bombers were still piston-engined, it was relatively easy for jet fighters to intercept them. 
as this mock battle between American B-29s and British Meteors shows. When the faster and higher flying jet bombers came into service in the early 1950s, this became more difficult. To deal with these bombers, a new type of fighter was therefore developed. This was the interceptor, which could scramble quickly from the ground and climb at high speed. The Convair Delta Dagger, which entered service in 1956, was the first true American interceptor. It could climb at 13,000 feet per minute and fly at well over 800 miles per hour. These interceptors came to be armed with air-to-air -air missiles, which were of two types. The first was known as heat-seeking, and through the use of an infrared sensor in the nose, locked onto the radiation emitted by the target aircraft's exhausts. The other type was radar guided, riding along a beam aimed at the target. Long range ground radar was, however, needed to enable the aircraft to scramble in time and intercept the bombers before they could strike. Both sides built extensive radar networks to protect their airspace. Soviet bombers would approach NATO airspace, hoping to remain undetected for as long as possible. But the radar station would be constantly searching the skies. Indeed, its radars never slept. Once it detected the bombers, the interceptors would be scrambled and the ground station would guide them towards their quarry until they located them on their own radars. The aircraft would then fire their missiles while still out of sight of their target and return to base. But the traditional fighter was just as important as the interceptor. The Second World War had demonstrated that victory on land depended to a large extent on achieving air superiority above the battlefield. Only fighters could do this. During the Korean War, the Soviet MiG-15 was to show itself to be superior to all the Western jets, apart from the North American F-86 Sabre. But even this was inferior, in some respects, to the MiG. It was, however, thanks to pilot superiority, most of the American pilots were World War II veterans, that the Sabres were usually successful. The apparent lesson to come out of Korea was that speed and maneuverability were still crucial to fighter performance. Consequently, the 1950s saw dramatic advances in these areas. The first supersonic American fighter was the North American F-100 Super Sabre. This made its maiden flight in May 1953 just before the end of the Korean War. The Russians replied with the MiG-19, NATO codename Farmer. Western European nations also produced supersonic fighters. Indeed, the British Hawker Hunter flew as early as July 1951 and was to become one of the backbones of the RAF and enjoy healthy sales overseas. The French came up with the Dassault Super Mystère, which was still flying with the Honduran Air Force in the late 1980s. 
type of flying clothing, the pressurized G-suit, was introduced to help pilots cope with the physical strain of executing tight maneuvers at high speed. By 1960, yet another generation of fighters capable of flying at Mach 2, or twice the speed of sound, had entered service. The Soviet MiG-21 Fishbed, which in 1959 established a world airspeed record of 1,464 miles per hour, was a good example. Like the interceptors, the air superiority fighters were now armed with missiles. But while the Russians retained cannon and machine guns in their aircraft, the Americans believed that the significantly longer effective range of the missile made the gun superfluous. Some even believed that the day of the dogfight was over. The first opportunity to try out this new form of air weapon in combat came in Vietnam. Here, two-seater F-4 Phantoms and F-105 Thunder Chief fighter bombers were initially deployed. They were armed with Sparrow beam-riding missiles and Sidewinder heat seekers. The American aircraft found themselves up against North Vietnamese MiG-17s and 21s, armed with both cannon and Soviet Atoll air-to-air -air missiles. The American air crews soon discovered that their missiles had serious limitations. For a start, the radar-guided Sparrow missile had a major drawback in that once the radar had locked onto a target, it was not able to simultaneously spot other threats, which laid the aircraft open to surprise attack. Furthermore, the American missiles had been designed to deal with an aircraft flying straight and level, and not with the highly maneuverable mix. Beam riding missiles had a further drawback. Once the aircraft had locked onto its target and the missile launched, it required half a mile to get onto the beam and arm itself. Any MiG which got within this range was safe and could fire with impunity. The realization that the air to air missile had not superseded the conventional cannon was confirmed during the 1967 Arab Israeli War. Here, Israeli pilots claimed over 50 air victories, but every single one of them was achieved with guns and not missiles, even though the Israeli aircraft were armed with them. This war also produced another concern. On the very first day, the Israeli Air Force launched preemptive strikes on Arab airfields. This enabled the Israelis to achieve air supremacy within but a few hours. What if Warsaw Pact aircraft launch similar surprise strikes on NATO airfields in Western Europe? The threat of a preemptive strike on its air bases was considered by NATO to be a very real one. One solution was to keep the aircraft in hardened shelters which were resistant to bomb damage, and all major air forces began to build these on a wide scale. But this did not overcome the problem of runways being put out of action, which the Russians got over by making their aircraft capable of operating from rough airstrips. Another possible solution was the vertical or short takeoff and landing VSTOL aircraft. <laughs> 
A number of nations have begun investigating this concept in the 1950s for both commercial and military purposes. The American Lockheed XFV-1 turboprop was one of many prototypes which actually flew. Another was the extraordinary looking flying bedstead, which was used as a test bed by the British aero engine company Rolls-Royce. Some V-style prototypes, like this German model, were more successful than others. But by the mid-1960s, most aircraft firms had lost interest, since fighter versions could not be made supersonic. Yet one V-style project did come to something, the Hawker Harry. This has jet nozzles which rotate through 90 degrees. The Royal Air Force deployed Harrier to Germany in the late 1960s as a close support and tactical reconnaissance aircraft. But the only foreign buyer was the US Marine Corps. Air support of ground forces in Europe became of greater significance as NATO's strategy turned from immediate nuclear retaliation to a Warsaw Pact ground attack to one that relied increasingly on conventional weapons, including air power. Aircraft can directly support the ground forces in two ways. Close air support means attacking targets within the ground battle zone itself. A supersonic aircraft is unsuitable, since most ground targets, like tanks, are hard for it to locate. Consequently, in the late 1970s, the Americans introduced the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt. Known affectionately by its pilots as the Warthog, the A-10 carries an impressive array of munitions, including a 7-barrel 30mm cannon. is also heavily armored and highly maneuverable. The other ground support role is interdiction, attacking ground targets behind the battle area to disrupt the move up of reinforcements and supplies. Initially, both sides used bombers for this, and a NATO example was the English electric Canberra. The Russians widely used the Aleutian Il-28, but ever-improving air defenses made the bomber vulnerable. Consequently, fighter bombers like the F-104 Starfighter came into service. This was fast enough to evade the defenses, but could fight its way through to the target if it ran into trouble. The Starfighter was to serve with many NATO air forces. There was also the Anglo-French Sepicat Jaguar, which entered frontline NATO service in the early 1970s. This carried over 18,000 pounds of bombs and missiles and could fly at Mach 1.6. Even faster was the Soviet Su-22 Fitter, which could exceed Mach 2. But the Cold War also saw aircraft which could clandestinely penetrate deep into hostile territory. The first of these specialist spy planes was developed in great secrecy at Lockheed Skunk Works at Burbank, California by Chief Research Engineer Kelly Johnson. His brief was to produce an aircraft which could fly high enough to avoid detection over the Soviet Union. The result was the U-2, which could fly up to 70,000 feet. 
In order to cover as much of the Soviet Union as possible, U-2s were deployed to Turkey. They also operated from Pakistan, and it was from here that in May 1960, a U-2 was tasked to fly across Soviet territory from south to north and to ultimately land in northern Norway. But pilot Francis Gary Powers had no idea of the furor his flight would cause. U-2 pilot Francis Powers duly took off from Peshawar Air Base, Pakistan, on the 1st of May, 1960. Cruising at 65,000 feet, he was soon deep over Soviet territory. Unbeknown to him, his U-2 was located from the ground. Surface-to-air missiles were fired at him as he flew blithely on. The Soviet radar operators saw the U-2 vanish from their screens as it tumbled earthwards, powers having successfully bailed out. The Russians quickly found the wreckage of Powers' aircraft and, more important, his cameras and film. He was put on trial in Moscow amid much publicity and embarrassment to the US government. U-2 flights over Russia were halted. Two years later, however, the U-2 played a crucial role in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. It was its photographs that confirmed that the Russians were deploying missiles in America's backyard. The Powers incident had confirmed, however, that the surface-to-air missile, or SAM, threat was ever-increasing. Many US aircraft lost over North Vietnam fell victim to this weapon. Furthermore, handheld SAMs, like the American Stinger, were introduced. These could be very effective against aircraft flying at lower altitudes. There were also highly effective mobile armored anti-aircraft artillery, or AAA systems, like the Soviet ZSU-23-4. Radar was the basis of these systems, and one way to avoid it was to fly at very low level. To enable high-speed jets to do this, onboard terrain-following radar was introduced. But there was another way around the problem, which was evolved by Lockheed Skunk Works. In 1959, they were tasked with developing a new spy plane, one which would be less detectable by radar than the U-2. The result was the SR-71 Blackbird. Capable of speeds in excess of Mach 3 and of flying at altitudes over 80,000 feet, the Blackbird's futuristic all-black shape marked the beginning of a new technology, stealth. The success of the Blackbird was to encourage Lockheed to develop stealth technology still further, but under the cloak of secrecy. The result was the F-117A precision night attack aircraft. Although it first flew in 1981, the Nighthawk was not revealed to the general public until seven years later. Its skin was designed to absorb radiation, and the shape is such as to diffuse radar beams and reflect them away from the emitter. The Cold War was virtually at an end when the Nighthawk came into service, but it was to dramatically prove itself during the 1991 Gulf War. Designers were also striving to improve combat aircraft performance in other ways. These included the introduction of what was called variable geometry, 
that is enabling the pilot to vary the sweep of the wings while in flight. An early example of the swing wing, as it's called, was a Soviet MiG-23 flogger, first spotted by Western intelligence in 1972. The flogger was designed to cope with high-flying supersonic nuclear bombers, but by the time it came into service, nuclear bombers had adopted the low-level approach in order to evade radar detection. Nevertheless, the MiG-23 was an impressive aircraft, capable of Mach 3 with its wings fully swept back. When flying subsonic, on the other hand, the wings were fully forward. Variable geometry was also used on the Panavia Tornado, a joint project by the Germans, Italians and British to produce a truly multi-role aircraft. But the Tornado could not perform the various missions as well as a single-role aircraft. Consequently, two types of the aircraft were built, an interdictor, designed to operate at low level, and an interceptor. However, the first swing-wing aircraft to enter service had been the American F-111 Aardvark in 1967. One of its major roles was as a tactical strike bomber. But the F-111 was also used as a nuclear bomber. However, it could not carry the same bomb load as the B-52 which by the 1970s was beginning to feel its age. A swing-wing replacement, the Rockwell B-1, was developed during the 1970s. It represented the state of the art at that time. But cuts in the US defense budget forced the cancellation of the B-1 in 1979. The bomber was, however, resurrected to carry a new weapon, cruise. This is a precision standoff missile which can be launched at ranges of nearly 1,500 miles from its target and carries either a nuclear or conventional warhead. Cruise flies at very low level to evade radar detection can be air, sea, or ground launched. Crews thus represented a very significant enhancement of the nuclear triad and meant that aircraft could launch it from friendly airspace. The redesigned B-1 entered US Air Force service in 1985 as the B-1B Lancer. It soon established a large number of world records for speed payload and distance. But in the early 1980s, countering a Warsaw Pact ground attack into Western Europe took on a new shape. The chief architect of this was General Bernard Rogers, the NATO Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He recognized that blunting an attack by trying to repulse successive waves was unlikely to succeed. Rather, NATO should concentrate on destroying the Warsaw Pact follow-on forces, and in this, air power would play the key role. In late 1989, communism in Eastern Europe collapsed from within. The barriers separating the two Europes came down. The Cold War was over. The threat of a third global conflict this century faded into the background.